welcome to this special conference. We are delighted to have today here Seth Benzel. Um, he's uh, coming from uh, MIT. He's a postdoctoral associate at MIT in, um, in the initiative of the digital economy in the group of productivity, employment, and inequality. He's got a PhD in economics, but actually his background is quite varied because he's got economics, but also physics, mathematics, and political science, if I'm not wrong. So he's a pretty interdisciplinary person, which is uh, something that is very valuable these days. Um, his work on several, you know, many topics. Let me just highlight maybe a couple that I thought were of uh, much relevance. One is on skill bias, technological changes, and directed and propagation through the economy. And another focus in his research is predicting how new technologies, especially artificial intelligence, will impact investment, wages, and welfare in our societies. Um, I'm not gonna delay this much, so I'm just gonna say that he is today gonna talk about new technologies and the economy, challenges for workers, managers, investors, and governments. And he's gonna make a presentation, he would take clarifying questions, if there are any, along the, the talk, but mainly the most uh, deep questions will be at the end. Okay, so thank you, uh, Seth, for being here with us, and I'll sit down there so I can follow your presentation better. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I should say that this is not my first time at the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. I was lucky enough to be here uh, for a uh, course on macroprudential policy that I had a great time at, saw some lectures by Jordi Galli and learned a lot. And so it's a real honor to be invited back here and repay the expertise that you gave me, maybe tell you something that you guys haven't heard before. Um, so, some room. Okay, new technologies and the economy. I'm just gonna launch right into this presentation. Uh, I'm gonna aim to leave about a half hour of questions at the end. So if we get, you know, if we get start getting close at six o'clock, you know, wave at me and I'll start to wrap it up. Okay. So I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about how technologies have changed the economy over the last 30 years. And I'll focus on three big effects in particular. Then I'll talk a little bit about emerging technologies and how they might start to impact the economy, especially in the short term. Um, and then finally, uh, with the remaining time, talk a little bit about some proposed solutions to these challenges for those four groups that I talked about. Okay, so I want to focus on three big changes that have occurred in the economy over the last 30, 35 years that seem to be tightly related to technological change. The first is a decrease in labor share. The second is skill polarization. And the final one is a superstar economics for firms and workers. So a decrease in the labor share of income. So I'm sure many of you have heard that one way of thinking about all of the money that is made in the economy is you can slice it up and you can say there's a certain slice that's paid to workers and employees, and there's all of the rest, which is potentially paid to um, people who own businesses, who own land, who own capital and rent it out, uh, or through profits. Uh, what we've seen since approximately going up until 1980, you know, I'm sure you, know, you guys are all econom economists, you've all worked with Cobb Douglas production functions, one of the interesting things about a Cobb-Douglas production function is that it generates um, labor having a fixed share of national income, according to the parameters that you choose. And that production function was actually selected as the most common one because it generates that phenomenon. And if you look at the United States data, we had a relatively constant labor share at around two-thirds of national income from really as far back as we've measured it, 1800s, until around 1980 or so. Of course, with variation year on year, but relatively constant around that level. What we've seen in the United States and across the Western, and across the developing, excuse me, developed world, is a decrease in labor share of income. So uh, for Spain in particular, we've seen a decrease from 1980 to the present of about 68% of national income 
to about 60% today. So intuitively, you might think that this has to do with new automation technologies, right? If you can do a job uh, with a machine instead of a person, it makes sense that machines would get more of national income and workers would get less of national income. But there's still, but you know, correlation's not causation. We want to look at some more micro-level evidence tying these two phenomena together. And there are a lot of papers like that. So one paper like that is Asimoglu and Restrepo 2017 and um, instrumenting for robot adoption by different counties in the United States, they find that the adoption of one more ro industrial robot, this is a focus on industrial robots, per thousand workers reduces the employment rate by about 0.2 percentage points, increases, decreases wages by about 0.3%, and increases GDP by about 0.15%. So there you go. So wages and employment go down, GDP goes up, labor share is going down because of these robots being adopted. A second phenomenon I'd like to focus on is, inter is skill polarization. So this is another phenomenon that's occurred across uh, different countries in the Western world, the developed world, where the share of workers that are doing middle wage jobs has gone down. So, um, in Spain, so this happened in the United States, it happened across Europe. And to focus on Spain for a moment, the share of workers working middle wage jobs has fallen by 12 percentage points. The amount working low wage jobs has increased by two percentage points. And the amount working by high, um, high wage jobs has increased by 10 percentage points. So you might call this employment skill polarization, so how many people are doing jobs of different wages. Alongside this, we've also seen wage uh, skill polarization. So wages for people at the low end and the high end have gone up, while wages for people in these middle wage jobs has gone down. Um, how can we connect this to technologies? Well, there's a very famous paper, the Ottawa and Doran 2013 paper in the AER, which looks at different regions in the United States and says, well, what kind of technologies have been the powerful ones over the last 30 or so years? And it focuses on the technologies replacing routine tasks, that what the sort of computer technologies and industrial robots that had been invented over that time period were good at replacing humans in very routine, formal, standardized tasks, such as you know, office paperwork, um, you know, bureaucratic moving papers around, as well as certain um, industry, industrial jobs. And what they point out is in that labor markets that at the beginning of the period were relatively focused on industries that were routine job intensive, those regions saw more adoption of information communication technologies, in particular personal computers, saw increased wage and employment polarization, so they got even more polarized than regions that weren't previously focused in that, and they received inflows of skilled labor. So presumably, their inflows of skilled labor were to operate all of these machines that were being imported to replace the middle, work, middle wage workers. Okay, then the final thing I wanted to say has happened over the last 30 or so years is a rise in really top-end inequality for both companies and for workers. So in terms of workers, we, I'm sure you've all heard about the rise of the 1%. And what's important is that that's not a phenomenon that's just driven by profits and capital income. That's a phenomenon that's present in wages as well. So wage inequality has increased dramatically. These are both figures about the US, about US uh, laborers. As you can see, the share, of, uh, the share that has gone to the top 25% of workers has increased dramatically. If you zoom into the top 10%, that's mostly driven by the top 2.5% of workers. Now here's what's really interesting. We can zoom in even farther to even richer workers. And what emerges is this fractal pattern. So within the top 1%, most of the increase in wage, most of the increase in the share has gone to the top 0.25%. Within the top 0.1%, 
most of the increase in the share has gone to the top 0.025% and so on. So there seems to be this fractal pattern of not only are the rich getting richer than lower income people, but the super rich are getting even richer than the rich people are getting. And then the super duper rich are getting even richer than the rich, super rich are getting. Um, and so that's, that's this kind of superstar economics that people have associated with new digital economies. So a famous paper that kind of started thinking about this is Rosen uh, 1981, which is a paper uh, called, I think it's called Superstar Economics or something like that. And what he points out is that digital technologies tend to lead to these winner-take-all markets where if you're just a little bit better than the person before you, you get the entire market rather than you know, merely a little bit more of the market than the other guy. The metaphor he uses is for the music industry. So back in the old days, the story goes, if you wanted music, you'd have to hire a band of musicians to play at your house. But nowadays, uh, you don't actually have to hire a band. You can you know, stream some music on YouTube. And instead of all of us hiring different bands to play at our houses, we can all listen to the same YouTube video from the same superstar, right? So instead of that money getting spread around, one person is collecting a really large share of the money that's spent on music. Super, uh, so, oh, I should, uh, let me make one other note here. A lot of times people talk about the rise of the 1%, and so I wrote the rise of the 3% here. And what I mean by that is, so in this study that I took these figures from, Brynjolfsson and St. Jacques, what he points out is, so this fractal nature of the returns at the top end of the market doesn't really start at the top 1%. In fact, it starts at the top 3%. So hence, the rise of the top 3%. Okay, superstar firms. Same thing seems to be happening with regards to firms. This is uh, based on a new paper by Ator and Friends. Um, pointing out that globalization and technological change have also helped marginally better firms get bigger slices of the market. Uh, so what that means in a lot of industries, we've seen increased uh, concentration. So the bigger firms get bigger slices of the market. And the average amount of profits, because the big firm, because the most productive firms are the most profitable, and because the most profitable firms are getting a bigger slice of the market, the average profitability of the market rises, but the profitability is going to be really polarized. You're gonna get a couple of firms at the top that are really profitable and are very large, and then a bunch of smaller firms that are only marginally profitable. Um, related to this phenomenon is uh, this phenomenon of digital platforms. So digital platforms are companies that operate based on facilitating transactions between either parties and taking a slice off the top. So you can think that's what Uber does, that's what Airbnb does, that's kind of what Facebook does. They facilitate communications between other people and then either by you know, taxing those transactions a little bit or by selling ads for the people who are on there naturally, they can make a lot of money. This is a superstar market too because there's a sense in which these platforms are natural monopolies, right? Uber, if you had a thousand different Uber apps, you know, you would always be futzing around to try to find one that had drivers in your area, right? It makes sense for there to be one or two big ride-sharing companies, similarly with Airbnb. Uh, and social networks, right? It would be terrible if there were 50 different social networks and I couldn't send messages to all of my different friends who might be on different ones. So these are natural monopolies that lead to superstar effects in firms. What's also interesting about these platform companies is they tend to not have a lot of employees despite us thinking they're very profitable. So you think about a company like Marriott, which has 200, so these numbers might be a little bit old, so maybe about a year old. Uh, Marriott has about 200,000 employees worth about $35 billion. Airbnb, founded much more recently, and not to mention all of the land owned by Marriott and the capital and the hotels. Airbnb, founded in 2008, only 5,000 employees, market cap all in the same ballpark. Okay, 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about new technologies that are on their way, how they might start to affect the economy. So, we've got, so Boston Dynamics is a company up in Cambridge that was recently uh, purchased by Google and I think resold again, but that's uh, news. And you can see uh, this is their Atlas humanoid robot, which is capable of trying to pick up a box. Um. <laughs> Uh, my friend was telling me that we should like label the box as, as to say your jobs. I'm trying to. <laughs> uh, poor robot. So I'm going to mostly not focus on robot technologies, though. The, these like really kind of humanoid apparatuses. I'm going to mostly focus on machine learning technologies because I think that's the most interesting and exciting technological change that's, re that's really starting to affect the economy right now and will be affecting the economy over the next several years. Okay, so what are artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning? So broadly speaking, we think of these as, one way to think about these is nested concepts. So artificial intelligence is any sort of technique for using a computer to simulate human intelligence, right? Back in the old days when artificial intelligence was just getting started, sometimes referred to as the good old days of AI, a popular approach was expert systems, right? So um, you would say you would have a system for deciding whether something was one kind of tree versus another kind of tree, and you just sort of follow a taxonomic key to try to figure out what category it would go into. Does it have serrated leaves or smooth leaves? Does the bark like this or is the bark like that? And it would have to be a human that would sit down and type in that information. Um, that approach, additionally, there are approaches to artificial intelligence that were popular at that time, um, including like brute force uh, algorithms, uh, excuse me, brute force proof solvers, right? So you could say, um, computer prove that prove some theorem, and you'd give it a list of five to ten axioms that it could manipulate, and then just by trying every single possible combination of axioms, eventually you could at least brute force a proof, at least you have a chance of brute forcing a proof. Those approaches to artificial intelligence hit a dead end and led to something called the AI winter during the 80s. And the AI winter a lot of people blame on a principle called Polanyi's paradox. So Polanyi's paradox, Polanyi was, I believe, a French economist, don't quote me on that. Um, and he's, he, what he pointed out was, we know more than we can explain. So in other words, I'm very good at identifying what objects in my environment are chairs, right? If you show me 100 objects, I can pretty reliably pick out which one of those is the chair. But it's really hard to explain to a computer when you see a certain pattern of pixels, that pattern of pixels is a chair versus a different pattern of pixels isn't a chair. Similarly, um, Go players, master Go players, will often say that sometimes they know that a move is the right move but they can't exactly explain why, or they'll only be able to offer some really vague explanation. So in chess, you know, there's these principles of you shouldn't double up your pawns, but when you can break that rule is often an intuitive decision that a grandmaster just kind of feels and can't really explain in a way that could be formalized and mathematized in a way a computer could deal with. So how do we overcome this fact that there are things that humans can do, but we can't just like make a list of steps for the computer to replicate it. Well, the answer is machine learning. And so machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence that uses, that is based around the idea of as you give the computer more information, more data, it should be able to get better at doing the task. There are two popular ways of doing machine learning one of which is called reinforcement learning and one of which is called supervised learning. Supervised learning is you take, um, you take some uh, data and you classify the data into one bin versus a second bin. So for example, you could take um, a thousand photos, 
take, label 500 of them as pictures of cells that are cancerous and 500 of them as cells that aren't cancerous. And you could say, computer, hey look, here's 500 images of cells that are cancerous, here are 500 images of cells that aren't cancerous. It's supervised in the sense that you have already kind of pre-labeled some of the data that you're gonna hope the machine's gonna learn what underlying pattern unites those two, unites that difference. Secondly, there's reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is when you have some sort of utility function you want the computer to maximize. So for example, you might say, computer, win games of Go. And so the computer will start off by playing games of Go randomly. And eventually it'll notice that some moves are more likely to lead to victories and some moves are more likely to lead to failures. And the idea is that the more simulated games of Go that the computer plays, the more it will detect patterns in the moves that tend to lead to victories and patterns in the moves that tend to lead to failures. There's also unsupervised learning which is um, a cluster of techniques for dealing with data where there's, we don't really have a right answer, right? So I sometimes work with principal component analysis, which is kind of a very basic unsupervised machine learning technique, where what you want to do is say, hey, this is really noisy data, but around some related concepts, I want you, computer, to kind of extract what the unifying, what the unifying underlying, um, variable is that's generating all of these different uh, related data sets. So that's kind of an unsophisticated, unsupervised machine learning technique. Uh, people are working on more sophisticated ones, but this is much more difficult because it, you know, to, if you really wanted a computer to be able to reason outside of context and to generate its own concepts, that's obviously a very, very hard problem and in some ways, you know, harder than sorting images or winning a game. Um, deep learning is a subset of machine learning that has been very pop, very, that has recently become very powerful at solving a bunch of problems involving um, either supervised learning or um, reinforcement learning. And what it relies on is a layer of neural networks where each layer detects some feature. So the, the bottom layer detects some, the, each neuron in the bottom layer detects some feature of the raw data, passes that on to the neurons in the next layer. The next layer, they detect patterns, they uh, evaluate what the signal sent to them by the layer before them, and then iteratively, at the last uh, layer, it gets a prediction about what the right next move is or how to sort the two images. So deep learning has become very, very powerful, especially for image recognition in the last few years. Now these techniques might, start, might sound arcane or you know, available only to cutting edge researchers, but that's actually not true. So neural networks and deep learning have recently, in the last couple, last year or two, have become increasingly available to ordinary schmoes like you and me who aren't computer scientists. One organization that's great for this is Fast AI, which has excellent um, online courses on how to do uh, neural networks and machine learning. Another is Kaggle. So Kaggle is a way that if you were a business or an individual who wants to gain the benefits of machine learning on some sort of um, prediction task, you can outsource that. So if you've heard of Kaggle, it's a place where businesses can post uh, prediction tasks such as, hey, I'm a bank and I want to predict based on past data which of these mortgages will default. And you can just send out data, presumably in that case hopefully anonymized, and try to get people to develop algorithms that can predict what's happening in that data, and so now you've got the benefits of AI for your company, but you don't have to have the AI experts in your company. And then finally, a lot of these neural network and machine learning tools are themselves a little bit finicky to implement, but so now the question becomes, can we automate the implementation of the machine learning tools? And so uh, AutoML is just one approach trying to work in that direction, one, one group. Okay, so just to show you how easy it is to use neural nets and do image classification, I built an image classifier following FastAI's directions. And so I built a classifier that classifies images as either images of La Tomatina 
or San Fermines. So the number above these images indicates uh, how certain the compute my algorithm was that the image is of zero for San Fermines and one for Tomatina. So these are the three images that are the most San Fermines' images on Google Image, and these are the three images that are the most Tomatina-ish images on, on, San, on uh, Google Images. Um, you can also look at that very last layer of the neural network. The very last layer of the neural network, all it does is look at every, every corner of the picture and says, does this corner look like San Fermines? And you can ask it, okay, which parts of this image look like San Fermines? So this is one of the images. Unsurprisingly, the bull part looks a lot like San Fermines, and to a lesser extent, the guy with the red sash looks like San Fermines. And this kind of blew my mind. I didn't expect it to work this well. So I started with 800 Google image pictures that my uh, gracious research assistant put together for me. I set aside, I took two thirds of them and used them to train the algorithm. And then one third I reserved as validation. So the computer didn't get to see those when it decided what makes an image San Fermines E versus La Tomatina E. And then on that reserved validation set, the computer only screwed up three images. It got 245 of 248 images correctly sorted. Here are the three images it incorrectly sorted. These two are San Fermines, but were incorrectly given values of greater than 50%, so the computer thought it was Tomatina. As you can see, there's no bulls in these. And also, there's this big red balloon, which I think the computer thinks is a tomato. Um, and then here's the one image that was of Tomatina that was misclassified as San Fermines. What I think is happening here is the red, the red bandana, it thought was San Fermines. -y. Okay, and so this is just another way of thinking about how machine learning has gotten really excellent at this image classification task. Um, uh, let me take a second here to plug the AI index which is a project that's ongoing by Stanford to collect different measures of how artificial intelligence and machine learning has been getting better over time. Uh, it's a Stanford project, but working with people at the MIT Initiative on Digital Economy, and maybe it could be some raw data of use to you in your studies. Um, and what we can see here is on the ImageNet, ImageNet um, LSVRC task, don't ask me what that stands for, um, AI systems have started to surpass human performance in just this very simple task of here's a picture, it's maybe of a horse, it's maybe of a dog, it's maybe of one of these 1,000 objects, tell me what this is a picture of. Um, and companies, businesses have started to notice and are starting to make massive investments in artificial intelligence. Um, the VC investment in AI startups has gone from almost nothing to over $3 billion in recent years per year. Uh, not to mention the $500 million that Google paid for DeepMind, which is the team uh, behind AlphaGo that recently beat the world champion uh, Go player. Okay, so now let's think about, so these, these technologies are really cool. They are certainly really good for uh, image recognition. Um, how many jobs are things that current machine learning techniques are good at? So, and one way to think about things that current machine learning techniques are good at, supervised or reinforcement learning, um, is does the task require mapping a standardized input to a standardized output with a clear success criteria? If the job is just that, then it's really suitable for machine learning. Um, so what my colleagues Brynjolfsson, Mitchell, and Rock did is evaluate 964 occupations um, a and looked at how, what percentage of the tasks in those occupations were suitable for machine learning. What they found was that almost no, ta that almost every task had some component that was suitable for machine learning. Almost every job has some <laughs> component which is like look at something and make a standard decision about it. Um, but almost no jobs were 100% suitable for machine learning. And remember that we're not talking about um, robots in general now, right? So if the task involves, you know, picking something up at some point, even if it, apparently it's a task that's not easy for me either. 
If it involves picking up something at some point, even if it was in a really standard way that an industrial robot would be good at, we're not going to call it suitable for machine learning here. Um, and so, therefore, at least according to that criteria, almost none are, complete, are able to be completely replaced by um, machine learning. And so just to give you two examples of one job that's considered by this uh, procedure really suitable for machine learning is credit authorizers. So you can imagine a guy sitting at a bank and deciding, mm, so here's this guy's credit score, this is his financial records, this is his job, should I give him a loan? That's a task that's really suitable for machine learning versus something like massage therapists where it's bespoke interactions, you have to be hands-on with the client, that's something machine learning isn't going to really help you with. Um, what is also interesting about this study that was just done is you can plot, this is a plot of the wage of an occupation, those 964 occupations, against how suitable it is for machine learning. These are uh, US wages. And what's interesting here is that there's really seems, there's almost no correlation, right? Maybe there's greater variance at the bottom than at the top, but there's no average relationship between the wage of the job and its suitability for machine learning. And maybe that shouldn't be so surprising. There are, in fact, some pretty high-end jobs that we think might be suitable for machine learning. So one in particular might be radiology or um, uh, doctors who look at biopsies, right? If the task is to like look at a medical image and decide, does this, have, does this have cancer? Is this a broken bone? Does the guy have condition X? That's kind of exactly the thing that machine learning is good at. So that's an example of a high, high skill job that is potentially suitable. And of course, there are lots of low skill jobs that are suitable as well. Um, in one in particular that people have been talking about a lot, or maybe it's a middle school job, is uh, automated driving and uh, your truck drivers. You can think about truck. You can think about car driving as being a task of matching standardized inputs to standardized outputs. This is the picture of the road. You know, try not. You know, the, the clear success criteria is you got there and didn't crash into anything. Um, to the extent that roads are unpredictable and kind of crazy things happen, that's the extent to which automa automated driving is more of a challenge. Um, there, are other ch there are other estimates of jobs vulnerable to automation out there, including the study by Frey and Osborne and um, a recent study by McKinsey. And McKinsey finds that 48% of Spanish work hours are spent on tasks technically automatable by adopting current technologies. I, would, I should just point out quickly that other countries are pretty similar. 48% isn't particularly good or bad. Um, when he, they say technically automatable by adopting current technologies, they're thinking about things like that Atlas robot that I showed you before that could bend over and pick up a, a box that it's been told to pick up. In the near term, that's not economically feasible, right? I, the boss, uh, gen, excuse me, Boston Dynamics doesn't tell you how much one of those Atlas robots is, but they're certainly not for sale, and they're almost certainly extremely expensive, right? So at least in the near term, you shouldn't be worried about most of these 48% of work hours being substituted with computers for just financial reasons. Um, what I should also point out here, and at the previous stage, is that now we're talking about 48% of work hours. And previously I told you most jobs have some component that are suitable for machine learning. And so one important thing to think about in the coming years is to what extent can jobs be reorganized so that the slice that the machine does can be separated from the part that the, only the human can do. Um, and I'll elaborate on that point shortly. So machine vision and the Cambrian explosion. So one question we, that faces us now is to what extent are these new technologies actually going to start to lead to the nature of work changing dramatically? Well, on the side of there will be a big change is uh, an anecdote from, or at least a theory of the Cambrian explosion. So uh, you may or may not remember from science class, um, there was a period of time uh, on Earth where there were a bunch of small organisms going around, and then suddenly, in a 
this Cambrian explosion, there's a dramatic expansion of the diversity of, or, of uh, creatures in the sea, all different sorts of crustaceans and things like that. Um, and there are different theories of what, what the bottleneck that was overcome that led to the Cambrian explosion was. Um, but one theory is it was, the it was the development of the eye, right? And that enabled um, this vast explosion in types of creatures available. And so that would be an argument in favor of, you know, getting vision right for computers is a tremendous step forward. Um, the second point is, is as I was just talking about, um, it's very few jobs are completely suitable for machine learning, right? There's, all, there's some component in which uh, really a human has to touch the job and finish it off or start it or deal with edge cases. Uh, the example I think of here is uh, automated delivery and the last 10 steps, right? So you might imagine that, you know, it's five years from now and automated cars are starting to hit the market and uh, Amazon wants to start delivering its packages via these automated cars. Well, so the automated cars is really good at getting outside the apartment building, but now somebody's got to, now <laughs> somebody's got to pick up the box, get inside the apartment building, ride, you know, negotiate with the guy at the front desk, get up to the fifth floor and knock on the door and, you know, even, you know, knock really softly and you leave a note and they probably never even brought up the box. Yeah, it's happened to me a couple of times. Um, but see, the, the point of that anecdote is that even though the computer can do 95% of the job, which is navigate the car to all of the correct destinations, that last 5%, which is get the box to the door, if that can't be replaced, well, then you might have to have a human do all 100% of the job, right? Because it's not clear that you can reorganize that task so that you don't need a human the whole time. You might just need a guy riding in that truck the whole time. So across different fields, a major question will be, to what extent can we reorganize tasks? Um, the next thing is, um, we're not talking about artificial general intelligence. These are not actually thinking machines um, that can reason outside of context or do causality in a sophisticated way. Um, so that is a significant limitation. Um, and then there's kind of a question of like, are AIs creative? Um, kind of depends who you ask and what you call creative. Um, there's talk of artificial intelligence um, making uh, musical compositions that people enjoy. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, there was that horrible video about uh, automated, automatically generated children's um, YouTube videos that was quite bizarre. I don't know if any of you guys saw that story. So um, certainly creative, um, not, not maybe good. Um, and one additional example here is you can kind of use neural networks to simulate a kind of creativity. If you go on to deepdreamgenerator.com, they have a neural network that allows uh, the computer to kind of, what the computer does is it looks at parts of the image and it says, wow, this kind of looks like X. And then what deepdreamgenerator.com has its computers do is make the, that part of the image look more like the thing it kind of looks like. So this is another San Fermines image. You know, the bulls start turning into dogs. This guy with the camcorder back there turns into like a bird. Um, this guy over here and his friend turn into some sort of long-stemmed plant. Um, so I don't know if you want to call this creativity. It's certainly um, trippy. Okay. All right. So I've told you that new technologies have come around and might be reducing the labor share. I've told you that more technologies might come around and continue to do that. So kind of the next question is, well, you know, people have been worried about this before and there are still jobs. So what's kind of the economic um, effect that makes sure that, you know, we haven't all lost our jobs 100 years ago? I'm sure you've all heard of Ned Ludd, who in England, at the birth of the Industrial Revolution, led a bunch of workers in the destruction of textile mills because they were upset that the textile mills were um, eliminating jobs for kind of middle, middle wage, uh, moderately skilled uh, textile worker, uh, you know, t textile artisans. 
and replacing them with either machines or very low-skilled work for children and uh, other you know, people who didn't have to have that sophisticated knowledge of how to sew, they just needed to operate the machine. Um, and then Keynes later in his essay, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, which is a common touchstone for thinking about um, technological change in the long run, is also worried that over time we might get a scenario in which the development of new technologies eliminating old jobs is more rapid than the rate at which the economy can create new jobs. Okay. So people have been worried about this in the past. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about how economists think about automation. So I don't know if any of you have run into models of automation. Just a couple, you know, three or four standard ones out there. Um, generally, what they do is they model um, job, they model automation as a form of capital that can substitute for workers in certain tasks or industries, right? So you might imagine that. Uh, so one really simple way of this is. The Ottawa Endorn 2013 paper, final output is made out of low-skilled service workers, uh, middle-skilled routine workers, and high-skilled um, abstract workers, plus capital, right? So that's the old economy is chugging along like that. And then there's a change, and now routine work can either be done by routine middle-wage workers or be done by a form of capital. So that's a standard way of modeling automation and technological change. Um, in Benzit, one of my papers, we think about it as software being able to replace certain kinds of uh, abstract, technologically savvy workers, but also being created by them. Um, in a more recent paper, one of, one of the downsides of those models of automation is that the labor share tends to only go down, right? You, you create some more automation, the labor share goes down. And in the long run, perhaps the labor share goes to zero, or perhaps it goes to one. There's very little balancing it. Um, in Osmogu and Restrepo 2017, they add an additional mechanism following what Keynes suggested, which is that in addition to automating old tasks, so you might imagine, so look at that top line graph. This is a figure from their paper. Um, there's a certain uh, length of ta you know, interval of tasks that people do. Then the second line, what happens sometimes is we're able to create new tasks for labor to do, which replaces some old tasks that used to be done only with capital. So you're inventing a new job for humans to do, which is better than some old job, and you stop doing that old job. Or you can take some jobs that humans do, and you can invent some way to automate that. And so that job that used to be done with labor now can be done with capital. Okay. So in those sorts of models, why do economists, if you believe those sorts of models, why is it that economists don't worry about wages being permanently depressed or labor demand being permanently depressed? Well, in the short run, what these models are going to do is two things. There's a technological change, this automation technological change, that's going to increase GDP and interest rates. And it might also have the negative effect of lowering wage, or uh, maybe, potentially negative effect of lowering wages and the labor share, right? So why are wages going to increase in the long run? Well, in the long run, labor demand increases because the increased GDP and interest rates leads to capital deepening. So people go look at the world and they say, wow, interest rates have gone up. I really want to, this is a really good time to save and invest. Oh, and also GDP went up, so I have more money to save and invest. That leads to capital deepening. There's the, remember, there was that certain subset of jobs that only humans could do versus only robots can do. And eventually, the capital deepens so much that the stuff that robots can do is saturated, and now labor is relatively scarce again. And labor is relatively scarce again, but now with more capital and with more technology, so labor demand and wages are higher than they were in the beginning. Um, there are two assumptions there. The first assumption is that there's one thing that only humans can do, right? There's, there's some subset of things that you can't do with capital at all. Um, if you say that robots can do everything, then you end up with an AK growth model, which maybe some of you have run into. Um, the other assumption is that when people say see higher interest rates, they want to save and invest more. 
That's a consequence of using a representative agent in your model of the economy. If, you all, if you've worked with an economy with a representative agent, you know that in the long run, the interest rate has to equal the discount rate. So no matter what happens in the economy, if the you know, technological change increases interest rates in the short run, that's going to lead to people saving and investing more, bringing down the interest rate. And remember, we've got more capital and we're more productive. So at the end of the day, the, something else has got to increase, and that's got to be wages. So maybe you don't like those assumptions, but those are the assumptions that are typically made. OK. So now we've got, so I've told you about the theory kind of up until now. So what do I think are the big open questions? So um, one that I'm trying to work on now, and is, I, I think is potentially the most interesting open question, at least to me, and I don't have a good answer yet, so don't ask me. I can speculate, is, um, is technology directable? So in other words, uh, so for example, in the model of Asimoglu and Restrepo, what people can do, what innovators, entrepreneurs, scientists can do is they can say, hey, look, wages are really low right now. That means it's really good if we invent something for workers to do, because when we have a business that hires those workers, we'll make a lot of profits, right? Or they might say, hey, look, wages are really high right now. Let's invent a way to automate workers, and then you know, we'll drive down the wages, and then we'll make more profits that way. Um, interestingly, um, if you think about, uh, so, so is technology directable? That's one example of how it might be directable. Excuse me. Um, this has two implications. It has a practical implication and a historical implication. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the question of the Great Divergence, which is why did the Industrial Revolution happen in um, the Netherlands and England instead of China, uh, some people theorize that the reason is, well, in England, uh, wages were higher than in China, so there was more of a need to economize on labor, and therefore there was an incentive to in invent labor-replacing technologies, and then that got the boost of the Industrial Revolution off. Fascinatingly, some people have the exact opposite hypothesis. Well, you know, in China, everyone was happy and satisfied, but in England, everyone was super poor, and workers were very cheap. Maybe they were, they were driven off their land by various uh, kind of land regulations. Wages were really low, and the people said, hey, you know, if we could build a factory and put these guys to work, we would make a lot of money. So those are two opposite theories of how directability of technological change may have led to the great divergence. In terms of um, current public policy making, the directability of technology is also extremely important. So uh, people like to talk about uh, minimum wages and labor protections, right? And sometimes uh, people will offhandedly say, well, or I've run into this, maybe you haven't, that if you raise the minimum wage for, let's say, fast food workers, well, McDonald's will find a way to automate those workers, right? And that's exactly this concern, right? So if, so if you have the minimum wage, there's going to be a short-term effect of maybe you reduce employment if you believe those studies. Maybe you don't replace, reduce employment if you believe the other studies. But in the medium and long term, there's an increased incentive to automate those kinds of workers, right? So if technology is directable, then the short-term effect from the minimum wage may be very different than the medium and long-term effect of the minimum wage or the labor protection. Uh, similarly, with immigration and upskilling, right? So if you get a burst of immigration of people with a certain skill, that might lead you to, in, uh, that's what happens in this Asimoglu 2002 paper, you get a burst of people with a certain skill, uh, there's an incentive to build tools that complement those workers, right? Because, hey, there's a lot of people that are going to use this tool, let's build something that they can use, and so that would be a direct technological change that benefits those sort of workers in the medium term. So in other words, if you get a burst of immigration of, let's say, high-skilled people, in the short term that might lower their wages because, you know, we, there's too much quantity of them, you tend to lower their wages, supply and demand. But in the medium term, as the technology is directed and you build new tools for these people, maybe the productivity effect outweighs that and they actually become more, they get, gain greater wages. The second open question is, is technological growth accelerating or decelerating? Um, there are some theoretical reasons to believe both. 
Um, there's a cool paper, Weitzman 1998, called Combinatoric Growth, where he says, okay, um, ideas come from combinations of old ideas, right? That's a kind of a natural model of ideas. If ideas are born from combinations of old ideas, then as you get more ideas, then the amount of potential ideas, because ideas are combinations of old ideas, increases not exponentially, but factorially fast. So the number, so if you think that that's how ideas grow, then we should have a lot of ideas because ideas grow really fast if they grow combinatorically. Um, alternatively, there's some evidence that at least the returns to certain kinds of research and development have decreased. So I know many of you may have heard of Moore's Law, which is this idea that uh, the processing power doubles every year and a half or so, um, and that perhaps we're off of pace, maybe Moore's Law is slowing down. What you may not have heard is the amount of money which is spent by um, AMD and Intel and these chip manufacturers to do the R&D to achieve Moore's Law has increased dramatically. So to get the same pace or even a decelerating pace of processor power growth, we've had to spend increasingly vast, increasing amounts of money. So that would be a decrease in productivity in that task. Similarly, uh, if you look at the rate at which new drugs uh, and medicines are patented, those have slowed down dramatically despite a large increase in the R&D spent on those. Um, finally, and this is a question I'm working on right now, We've got, I've got a paper with Brinjolfson forthcoming on this subject, is I told you in the previous um, slide that what these models of automation predict is the new technology comes along, that leads to a decrease in the labor share, so that's something we've seen in real life. But because the new machines are so productive, they have a really high marginal product, investment, investors want to, you know, high marginal product should mean a higher interest rate. You know, through the mechanism of businesses going and saying, wow, these computers are really great, I want to borrow money to build more of the computers and robots, um, and, but interest rates are actually really low. So why are interest rates and investment productivity growth so low? Um, so this is just a figure illustrating that, that interest rates have decreased as the labor share has decreased. So who's making the money? There's a bunch of different theories of what might be going on. I'm going to skip the guys that I think are wrong. I don't think that it's, uh, <laughs> but I don't think it's banking frictions um, because it, it, Bianchi and Biggio make a compelling case. It's actually a paper that I learned about in the macroprudential uh, course. They make a compelling case that it's lack of investment demand that's leading to the lack of investment. Uh, some people talk about secular stagnation. It's not enough aggregate demand. Let me tell you the three things that I think are plausible. The first, and this probably only explains a small part, is unmeasured output or, or deflation, right? So if there was some unmeasured output in the economy, growth, uh, perhaps from all these free growth goods on the internet, that would mean that output growth was faster than we thought it was. And if output, is, output growth is faster than you think it is, that means the economy is bigger than you think it is, that means deflation is larger than you think it is. So it, real interest rates would be higher than what we think real interest rates are. That's probably matters a little bit at the margin. Some estimates I've seen are in the range of 100 or so billion dollars in the United States in the value of these free goods. So that's not enough to make a major difference. A second idea, and this is something I'm working on, is that you can't just invest, go out to the store and buy one of these AI systems, right? The, the trick is the implementation of these systems, and there might be a really scarce amount of individuals or opportunities to employ them, and if there's no and if, if these opportunities or individuals are inelastically demanded, that could lead to increased interest rates and low investment. And then finally, people have talked about industry competition leading directly to an increase in profits. That one it doesn't really explain interest rates, at least as far as I can tell, but would generate some of the other phenomenon, low, low investment. Okay, so, um, tech, so what are the challenges? Well, first you've got the distributional challenges. So workers versus capitalists, we saw that labor shares going down. The second is safe investors versus people who like find these digital unicorns. So safe investors are getting the interest rate, which is like the real interest rate's almost zero right now, versus people who can really find these growth opportunities. 
and also inequality between the high-skilled and low-skilled workers. We saw the wage polarization in the groups of these superstars. So that's certainly one branch of uh, challenges from new technologies. A second one is um, other problems, right? So there's distributional challenges, other problems. One is that as you get a lot of people fired who had the old skills, you want them to get the new skills. But there's an issue in that you might get structural employment when there's a negative externality from there being a big ratio of people with bad old skills to new good skills. And what's going to happen there is the firms are going to say, hey, I'd love to post a job that requires the new good skills, but I looked out there in the labor force, and the labor force is 99% people with the bad old skills. It's going to be really hard for me to find someone with the new good skills. I'm not going to post a new job. And so that has a negative externality because then workers turn around and say, hey, they're not posting opportunities for these new good jobs. I'm not going to get the skills for the new good jobs. So there's potentially a role for the government there if you can identify these jobs or stepping stone jobs or job training programs to correct that externality. Second is insufficient saving. So this is a problem that doesn't seem to be operant right now. But I told you before, one of the assumptions of those typical models was that one of the assumptions of those typical models was a representative agent. But if you move one of these models of automation to an overlapping generations economy, what you'll find is that in overlapping generations economy, rather people save for retirement. And if you're saving for retirement, you're saving out of your labor income. So as the labor share goes down, the savings of the young will go down there'll be less saving and investment, and potentially, at least in some scenarios we outline, uh, the overall output and welfare of people in the economy can decrease in the long run from the technological change. It's not a Pareto decrease. The first couple of generations will benefit from the technology, but in the long run, future generations might be worse off. Um, and then finally, more fantastically, you might be worried about too many robots, so we all become alienated with each other because we all live in virtual worlds or with our huge teams of robots, that's the naked sun. I should mention a universe in which there are lots of robots and so there are no jobs, labor demand's very low. Or excuse me, the robots are very powerful, so labor demand is very low, but there aren't a lot of robots, so real incomes are low, is Asimov's Caves of Steel, it's very good. Naked sun is the opposite problem, too many robots, people get alienated from each other. Um, if you're worried about uh, the Terminator scenario, which is robots going around and killing all humans, a uh, very good book on the problem is uh, Nick Frost from Superintelligence. He's at Oxford Center for Existential Risk. He's got a lot of ideas about how you would deal with such a scenario. Um, and then some other issues I'm happy to talk about, uh, whatever you're interested in, privacy, intellectual property taxation, and algorithmic bias. <coughs> okay, so how to address these challenges. All right, workers. Um, in the short term, try to get implementation skills. So this is also from the AI index. The share of US jobs requiring AI skills has increased five-fold in the last five years. But in the long term, maybe focus on things that computers essentially can't do. So essentially interpersonal things. So um, I was at a conference a couple of years ago where people were talking about, well, you know, after those automated drivers come along, automated driving come along, in Brooklyn, there's such hipsters that they will have like bespoke artisanal bus drivers who are like surly at you and yell at you as you get on. Just because people like the personal touch, right? Think about how much people will pay extra for artisanal stuff just because they kind of they like it, right? Um, and so this is a, a comic ex making that same point. Um, firms, we talked a little bit. Reorg the challenge will be reorganizing tasks to fit machine capabilities using robotic decision-making when appropriate. So there's an interesting uh, paper came out recently by uh, Google DeepMind, point saying that they used um, their neural networks to automate the decisions about how to use electricity to cool um, digital data centers and found their electricity costs reduced 40% after they put the computer in charge of managing the fans and the air conditioning. Um, and then finally, um, for firms, um, you know, these platform companies are becoming increasingly important. They have a lot of different sort of economics of them that I'm happy to talk about. And if you're not a platform, but you're in an industry that's been disrupted by platforms, trying to decide how to live with those platforms. Um, for investors, platforms and scarce factors are a way to go. 
Um, governments and overcapacity. So this is an interesting paper, Jensen, 1993. He tells an anecdote about uh, the invention of radial tires. So apparently in the bad old days, people used to make tires that would wear down pretty fast. There was a technological innovation, and suddenly, extremely cheaply, every tire factory could slightly modify its process so that the tires lasted five times as long. So you can imagine like the supply of tires in the co economy has just quintupled, right? Now, if what they were making was a, a substitute for other goods in the economy, no problem. You know, you, the industry is now making more output, but people will buy more of it. But tires are pretty close complements to cars, and if you make tires cheaper, people aren't going to buy like three more cars, right? So there was pretty much, there was pretty fixed demand for tires, even though productivity for tires went up. And there was an issue in that no company wanted to be the company that shut down their tire factory, right? Even though the industry had dramatic overcapacity. And so there was an opportunity for mergers and acquisitions companies, investors to come in and, you know, in a smart way, start winding down these operations and to extract money from the businesses. So that's potentially another investment opportunity. And then finally, Perhaps interest rates will start to increase in the medium and long term as we bypass these bottlenecks that I was talking about before. And that's just Le Chatelier's principle, which is that elasticities of, elasticities of input are always more substitutable in the long run. If you have a, um, a bottleneck in the short run, eventually you'll figure out a way around that bottleneck. Okay? Uh, finally, for governance, um, and I'm going to throw it up to questions soon so we can focus on any more of these you find interesting. Uh, people have talked about a UBI, the pros and cons of that, um, whether people would be satisfied for income without work. Uh, I told, talked a little bit about why you might want to subsidize stepping stone jobs in education because there may be a negative externality in periods when the ratio of people with old skills to new skills is off. Um, Bill Gates talked about taxing the robots and relatedly you might think about selectively subsidizing R&D. So the question of whether you could even properly target these things and whether or not you could, to what extent, is technological technology directable? So that's a question. Um, I made an argument why minimum wage and labor protections, if technology is directable, might not be such a good idea. But if, te if technology is directable, but if technology isn't directable, and you believe more the story of these phenomena are happening because of a decrease in competition, well, maybe that approach makes more sense. Uh, Germany, in their Work 4.0 dialogue, has come along with this idea of personal employment accounts, which is the idea that the government would give you a grant when you enter the labor force that you could use on uh, some very specific uh, things, like relocating for a job or for uh, getting doing a job retraining program. So it would kind of be like a government transfer that you would be allowed to use on only a very restricted set of tasks and you would kind of invest and manage like an account. Um, and then most recently, Glenn Weil has proposed this idea of data as labor, which is the idea that people should be compensated for the data that big companies like Facebook and Google make their money off of. That has some practical implementation issues as well. Um, uh, but it's, and it's also unclear that it's going to reduce inequality because presumably data about rich people is more valuable than data about poor people. Okay. So uh, hopefully I didn't take too much of the time. I did want to leave time for questions. Um, so I do have some backup slides if you guys want to see more slides. But I think I'll turn it up to questions now. Uh, thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks a lot for the uh, presentation. Very, very interesting what you're um, talking about. Um, now that we have the slide of government up, um, you're talking about inequality, and uh, I'm surprised that you don't mention uh, inheritance, um, especially like a country like Germany, more than half of the wealth is inherited. And uh, in times where uh, you have a lot more gains on, from capital than from labor, um, do you think it would maybe make sense to talk about, about these things? Uh, so, so, so the question was, oh, I guess you were on the mic, okay. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to point out is, and emphasize is, is that the inequality is definitely happening within wage income too. So it's not just, a, so 
On this slide, I talked a little bit about, you know, like there's two distributional challenges. There's a challenge of maybe the people who own capital are getting too big a slice of the pie, and then maybe within workers, the people at the top end of workers are getting too big a slice of the pie. Certainly, if you can, in a non-distortive way, do a wealth tax um, and redistribute that, that would be a great way of, um, the, um, there are pro the issue is that there's problems with wealth taxes because people can move across countries to dodge them, especially if you're a super rich person who's really got the wealth. It seems like it's relatively straightforward to leave the country and to uh, you know, escape the wealth tax. That's why some have talked about doing a wealth tax at the international level. So I think Jeffrey Sachs has talked about this. Um, so my answer to the question of what about fighting inequality with a big wealth or inheritance tax is I think it would be hard to implement a big one at the level of a smaller, medium-sized country where the super wealthy can just leave. The World Bank. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm, I can't see why UBI should help with the bid that things are getting automated. I, I, I mean, I mean, I am a, I am largely fiscally responsible. I, I do lean to right when it comes to. I mean, I shouldn't really admit this, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't see. Why? Can you can you explain? So uh, the, why what? Why why UBI when robots are coming? Uh, well, the idea is if you end up in these situations where you've got large structural employment, um, either due to uh, just you know depressed labor demand and people pref the wages are too low and people don't want to take jobs, or because of the structural unemployment effect that people don't have the right skills for the workforce at hand. There's going to be a question of, well, you don't want, you definitely, you, you want people to have meaningful jobs, but you also want them to have income, right? And so the question is, so you definitely want to give money to the people who don't have jobs, potentially because of these technological changes. Um, and the alternative to a UBI, um, some people have talked about an EIT. So in America, we have a program called the EITC, which is the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is like a negative income tax. So the idea there would be, you know what, take a job, we don't care if it's low paying, and we'll give you a negative income tax, and that will be a way to help you. Um, the downside of a program like that is it doesn't really target the people at the very bottom, right? So you might imagine the people who can do a little bit of work, or excuse me, or do a job that leads to a little bit of wages are better off than the people who can't do a job that leads to any wages at all, right? So does it make sense? So there's a distributional question of does it make sense to try to get the money to those people rather than the people who are the very worst off? Another approach is just an expanded social safety net, so just more social services. And uh, the pros there is that you can try to target the money exactly at the groups you want to target. Uh, but the con is uh, the con is as you do more targeting, maybe you pr create perverse incentives. Um, so people have talked about in America. We, our unemployment insurance sometimes disincentivize people from getting jobs again because they'll look at the unemployment insurance and they'll say, wow, I'll make less money if I go to work at McDonald's. It doesn't make sense for me to do that, right? Um, so that's one downside of targeted welfare programs. Another downside of them is if I say, as the government say to you, I'm going to pay for 100% of your health care no matter what, right? Uh, and, you know, healthcare, especially for, you know, elderly people can get really, really expensive, right? And you, the, you hear these studies about, you know, maybe they spend X amount of dollars on the last months of a person's life. Mm -hmm. And if you said to a low-income person, hey, would you like, you know, us to spend a million dollars spent keeping you alive for an extra month at the end of your life? Or would you rather have that money now and you can spend it however you want in the form of a UBI? maybe some people would take that choice. So one, so, and similarly with a program like food stamps, 
you know, you hear these horror stories again in the United States of people getting food stamps and then immediately changing them into cash and then using them to buy something else. So the question there is, why not just give people cash if they, and they can spend it on whatever they want? So um, that's so pros and cons of different ways of getting uh, money to poor people. Um, regarding the skills mismatch that you addressed at several points um, for people who are already in a job or for fresh graduates or high school graduates, like what kind of tools can you think of that might work for, for us to like better predict which skills are relevant in five years, 10 years, 20 years? And um, so that also does not become like a planned economy. How, how would that work? And what, what tools are there? Are there any tools? And also that the right skills, like the right skills supply emerges at the um, together with the demand, like at the right location and at the right space. Uh, well, I can point you to two sources that I think are pretty interesting. The first is uh, this paper, Brinjolfs and Mitchell and Rock. It's in AER p, &P uh, or I guess they're AAJ p, &P is now, um, where they go through these 964 occupations and say, these are more suitable for machine learning, these are more not suitable for machine learning, so that might be a place to start, as well as this Frey and Osborne paper, uh, it's a little bit of out of date now already, even though it's only five years old. Um, and you can look at, so they rank, again, every single job, same way with the McKinsey study, every single job, which ones do we think are most sensitive to automation, which do we think are least sensitive to automation. Within, within jobs, so look at this, this line, technically automatable by automate, adopting current technologies. So if there is a job, if, suppose there are two jobs that are technically automatable, right? One of them is high wage and one of them is low wage. Well, you'd expect the high wage job to actually automate it first, right? So within, within, these McKinsey, within this McKinsey classification, I'd be most worried about the high wage jobs that are technically automatable. Um, in terms of just like kind of qualitatively, what skills would I try to invest, invest in? I would try to invest in interpersonal skills, um, it's certainly in the medium and long run. You know, any, any sort of coaching, um, you know, spiritual, um, you know, uh, counseling, a therapeutic job where you just kind of really want a human there, those are going to be the jobs that are the most resistant to automation. Um, and then uh, in the short and medium term, there will certainly be a lot of jobs um, implementing these technologies, right? So uh, there are lots of great massively online open courses out there uh, for picking up these skills. I'm sure that those of you in the computer science masters have already run into some of these. Um, and there are ways available to pick up those skills. But there's a question of how long uh, will there be jobs in implementing these technologies um, certainly we're in the boom time right now, but as the economy becomes more saturated with these technologies, presumably the wage for implementing and maintaining them will come down. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would like to know what is your outlook regarding development, um, developing countries? Because right now, still a lot of like or BRIC countries actually became large by exporting a lot of products to the Western world because labor costs were actually that low in these developing countries. So now, if we have robots who produce everything in our like you know in our countries now, like for example Germany now, like Adidas opened this like fully automatic sneaker uh, factory for the first time. Sneakers are now produced back in Germany. So why do we then like want to like shift any like capital to developing countries, and how do they then develop like especially Africa, for example? Uh, so it's an excellent question. I do have to admit that most of my research is focused on the developed world, so I'm now going to be in speculation mode. Uh, but to speculate, you know, rather than thinking about these as being um, economies within every single country, you can think about the world economy, right? And so in the world economy. Technologies are coming out that are substitutes for uh, routine workers, or they've already come out that are substitutes for routine workers. And there are increasingly technologies that are substitutes for these ML suitable jobs. And so you, so there's a question of how much 
work that's happening in Africa, other parts of the developing world that are like that. Jobs like rural farming aren't going to be automated. Well, although perhaps you know you don't, those aren't the jobs we want people to have in the long run, right? Those are, tend to be low-paying jobs. Um, it's certainly a huge challenge for the developing world, given that one of their huge advantages has been their cheap labor in these tasks. Um, one positive note is that these new technologies are making it easier for people to get online and do digital jobs. Those can be more easily outsourced. I'm thinking of things like Mechanical Turk, other crowdsourcing platforms, where if you're an American company and you find some subset of a job that a computer can't do for whatever reason, maybe it's a online, maybe it's a call center, um, or maybe it's some sort of like online help desk, that's going to be increasingly easy to outsource to these, these countries. And in the medium term, those might not be jobs that are automatable. So uh, there, I, I would say that there are some bright spots of um, things that might be possible to offshore that weren't previously possible to offshore that developing countries might gain, t gain an advantage at. But in more broadly, yeah, they, they are going to lose potentially one engine of growth, which is, you know, getting their low-skilled labor into these factories that, you know, the West uh, didn't have. Um, yeah, so I, 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 again, speculating, but I think it's not great news. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned, for example, call centers, and I mean, we got, like, bots already, so mm. I guess, like, call centers are, like, out of date already. Everybody, exactly, so that's already an old, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but I see your point, of course. Mm. I had a question about taxation uh, of robots and how the, the concept of ownership works in this case because many of the companies that you talked about that innovate at the frontier of technology explode and if they're owned by a very you know, handful of individuals, you end up with a massive distributional problem that you talked about. So my question is, how can you have a sensible ownership policy with this technology so that you still have an open society? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I guess the first question is, to what extent is the ownership of these really highly productive companies closed, right? So, you know, you and I can invest in Google and Facebook really easily. You know, middle class people can invest in Google and Facebook, right? So for the mature companies, I think this is less of a concern. The concern is, is that the next unicorn that comes around in Silicon Valley is going to, you know, only really, really super savvy connected VC investors are going to have an opportunity to invest in those companies right at the beginning, and that's where you make a lot of the money, right? Um, to the extent that it has become increasingly important to be well-connected and well-placed and highly skilled at figuring out which of these uni potential unicorns actually are going to be the next $500 billion company. Yes, this would tend to increase inequality. The way I would think about this, though, is I would think about it as more analogous to wage inequality, right? Because now we're not saying it's the business that's getting really high returns, because anybody can invest in a normally traded business. What we're saying is there's a certain kind of person who's got this really awesome form of labor, which is ability to decide which company is a unicorn, right? And then you're gonna make a lot of money if you can do that. So I would view this, uh, you're gonna, interruption. We're getting a very important part. Sure. To have also a lot of money the best. Only having this ability, I mean, if you're a person with nothing else, you Yes, it's certainly the case that if you're living hand to mouth, you don't get to participate in capital gains at all, right? Uh, that you don't get to participate in that. What I'm, the point I'm trying to make is, is that certainly middle income people have access to the rate of return that Google gets, right? Uh, and the rate of return that safe bonds get. The rate of return that Google gets has been pretty good, but in principle, the rate of return of all the stocks in the economy adjusted for risk 
should get the same rate of return, right? Everyone should have access to that so long as they have some money that they can invest. And that rate of return is high, but it's not super high. It's not out of line. In fact, interest rates are lower, low historically. So I showed you that real interest rates have gone down, right? So it's not, it's not, it's not the stock market that's got the absurd returns. It's the people who, can in, who have the special ability to invest in companies at the very beginning. That was the point I was trying to make. And so, and then in that scenario, it's more of a labor issue. Although, of course, you know, to be one of those people, you probably have to be very wealthy and well connected to start with. That's a fair point. Um, and so, then there's yeah, and then there's a taxation redistribution question. Certainly, there's lots of reason to believe that an economy that there's certainly lots of like moral reasons to want to live in an economy where income and consumption are well distributed. And um, yeah, and then you've got to, then you've got you got to do redistribution if you want to achieve that. If what's happening is that some people have the ability to make much more money than other people, that's you got to redistribute it if you want more balanced income. I hope that answered your question. <laughs>